Hare Krishna. Welcome to Books to Krishna. We hope you really enjoyed episode 6 of Leela Mirth. Now we are bringing to you chapter 6, An Unknown Friend, of the biography of Srila Prabhupada's Leela Mirth, volume 1, written by His Divine Grace Satya Sarup Das Goswami. This is the biography of His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedan Swami Prabhupada. All rights of the books are with Bhaktivedant Book Trust. We have received various testimonials over the last uh, uh, six episodes and these are in front of you. And uh, some of them are like Apoorna Praja Keshav Das, Sunil Agarwal Prabhu, Sarva Priya Das, Revati Prabhu, Ram Raj Prabhu, Shyam Gopinath Das, Lloyd Mackay. This has been received all over the world. Thanks for the encouragement. Now we will start chapter 6, An Unknown Friend. Let the sharp moralist accuse me of being illusioned. I do not mind. Experts in Vedic activities may slander me as being misled. Friends and relatives may call me frustrated. My brothers may call me a fool. The wealthy Mammonites may point me out as mad. And the learned philosophers may assert that I am much too proud. Still my mind does not budge an inch from the determination to serve the lotus feet of Govinda, though I am unable to do it. This is Madhvendar Puri. Aside from his difficulties with business and family, Abe had to survive the cataclysm of Indian independence and partition. He was not active politically, but was one of hundreds of millions affected by the violent dawn of Indian independence. While Gandhi and the Hindu-dominated Congress were demanding a united free India, the Muslim League, led by M. A. Jinnah, called for partition and their own Muslim nation, Pakistan. The conflict raged in August 1946. The outgoing British government invited Jawaharlal Nehru, Congress Party President, to form an interim national government, but the League objected. The Muslim cause could be denied. Jinnah had already declared August 16 direct action day, which amounted to little in most parts of India, but in Calcutta erupted in Hindu-Muslim rioting. In five days of violence, 4,000 died and thousands more were wounded. In the months that followed Hindu-Muslim rioting, repeatedly flared up throughout India. Early in 1947, when the new Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, met with Indian political leaders to plan transfer of power, riots again broke out as Muslims demanded Pakistan. At the threat of civil war, Congress finally agreed on partition, and on July 18, the Indian Independence Bill passed without dissent. One month later, India and Pakistan emerged as independent nations with Jawaharlal Nehru as India's first Prime Minister. Partition tore India, leaving 5 million Sikhs and Hindus in, in Pakistan, as many Muslims in India, and the Great Migration began. Refugees fleeing from Pakistan to India and from India to Pakistan clashed with each other and even with their own countrymen of the opposing faith and the violence that erupted claimed hundreds of thousands of lives. Srila Prabhupada had said, our independence movement was started by Mahatma Gandhi for uniting all the different sections of the people. But actually the result was that instead of being united, India was partitioned and the partition became so poisonous that formerly there was only sporadic Hindu-Muslim rights in some places. But now there was organized fighting between Pakistan and Hindustan. 
So actually, we were not being united. We were being separated. The Hindus would go to the mosque of the Muslims and break it. And the Muslims would go to the temples of the Hindus and break the idols. And they will think, we have finished the Hindu god. Just like the Hindus also think, oh, we have broken their god. They are all ignorant. God cannot be Hindu. God cannot be Muslim. God cannot be Christian. God is God. We have seen in 1947, Hindu-Muslim fighting. One party was Hindu. The other party was Muslim. They fought and so many died. And after death, there was no distinction who was Hindu or who was Muslim. The municipal men gathered them together in piles to throw them somewhere. They fought and in Bagh Bazar, there were heaps of dead bodies. And when it is a dead body, nobody could understand who was Hindu and who was Muslim. Simply, it was to be cleared from the road. Abe was not expecting Indian independence to bring any real solution. Unless the leaders were God conscious, what change would there be? Now he saw that instead of suffering at the hands of a foreign rule, the people were free to suffer under their own countrymen. In fact, the fighting and suffering had increased. Throughout the years of India's political struggles, Abe had never lost his desire to propagate Krishna consciousness. He had seen how promises of unity and independence had brought mostly higher prices and civic mismanagement. He had seen neighborhoods where Indians had lived peacefully for generations erupt in hatred and rioting in the wake of British and Indian diplomatic manipulation. It was as Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had described it. Persons who are strongly entrapped by the consciousness of enjoying material life and who have therefore accepted as their leader or guru a similar blind man attached to external sense objects cannot understand that the goal of life is to return home back to Godhead and engage in the service of Lord Vishnu. As blind men guided by another blind man miss the right path and fall into a ditch, materially attached men led by another materially attached men are bound by the ropes of fruitive labor, which are made of very strong cord, and they continue again and again in materialistic life, suffering the threefold misery. The Vaishnava prayer to his spiritual master, who has opened my eyes with the torchlight of transcendental knowledge, and he feels obliged to help humanity by bearing the same torch as a representative of the eternal Vaishnava Parampara. Abe wanted to shed the light of transcendental knowledge onto the field of current crisis. That had been the purpose of Back to Godhead, although since 1944, he had been unable to print the magazine. But even without the means to publish, Abhay continued writing. His most ambitious project was Gita Upanishad, his translation and commentary of Bhagavad Gita. Gandhi and others often spoke of the wisdom of Bhagavad Gita. Indians never forgot their Gita, but most proponents did not teach it as Krishna had taught it. They would not recognize Lord Krishna, the speaker of their Gita, as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, but would extract his word as slogans to bolster their own philosophies, whether political leaders, religious leaders or scholars, they almost invariably made their own symbolic and allegorical interpretation. Abe wanted to present Bhagavad Gita as it is. It was to be 1200 pages, three illustrated, beautifully bound volumes. For Abe, the books were already a reality from which he was separated only by time. Over the past two years, he had accumulated hundreds of manuscript pages he wrote in notebooks and on loose papers and then typed and numbered manuscript papers. Uh, he could never give the book his full time, but gradually it began to take shape. He also preached Lord Chaitanya's message through letters, writing to many leaders in the government to respectable acquaintances and to people whose article he had read or whose activities had caught his eyes in the newspaper. Presenting himself as a humble servant, he wrote to them 
of his ideas on how India's original Krishna conscious culture could be applied as a successful solution to all banners of dilemmas. Sometimes his letters drew replies and Abhay would respond fanning the sparks of interest wherever he found them. A well-known reformer, Mendra Pratap Raj, yeah, was forming what he called the World Federation. Abhay had read a news sheet when Mr. Pratap had published from Vrindavan in which he addressed all nation and people of the world and called for a unity of mankind. Abhay wrote to him suggesting that Lord Krishna's teaching in Bhagavad Gita provided a theistic science capable of uniting all religion. Mr. Pratap replied in May 1947, I admire your deep study of Srimad Bhagavad Gita. I myself am a great admirer of the great classic. I assure you that I am working strictly according to the book. Mr. Pratap mentioned his book, Religion of Love, and suggested that Abhay read it as if he wanted to know the World Federation's view of religion. In the meanwhile, Mr. Pratap wrote, I do not agree to your suggestion of making the name of Krishna or Govinda as the basis of the unity of religion. This would amount to conversion and won't lead to unity of religion. I highly appreciate your efforts in the direction of back to Godhead. Abhay got the book, read it, and in July 1947, while he was visiting Kanpur, wrote a reply. He had traveled to Kanpur not as a spiritual teacher but as a pharmaceutical salesman. Yet a typewriter had been available and out had come his preaching. In continuation of my last postcard, I beg to inform you that I have finished the reading of your book, Religion of Love. In my opinion, the whole thesis is based on the philosophy of pantheism and the approach is made by the services of mankind. Religion of love is a true religious idea, but if the approach is made through the service of mankind only, then the process is made imperfect, partial and unscientific. The true religion of love is perfectly inculcated in the Bhagavad Gita. Besides, you have not quoted any authority for all your statements, so it is more or less dogmatic. It is dif different men put different dogmatic views about religion and its essential, who is to be accepted and who is not to be. Therefore, the approach shall be and must be authoritative, scientific and universal. Abe then gave a summary of the Bhagavad Gita in 10 points concluding the highest service that can be rendered to mankind is therefore to preach the philosophy and religion of Bhagavad Gita for all time, all places and all people. But extended philosophical dialogue was not usually the result of his letters. In 1947, when Abe wrote to high government officers of the newly formed government of India suggesting a remedy for riots, they turned him away. When he asked to talk to, with the governor of West Bengal, the governor's secretary replied, His Excellency regrets that he is unable to grant you an interview at present owing to heavy pressure of work. When he wrote to the assistant secretary, to the minister of education, an assistant to the assistant secretary replied, The government of India regret that they are unable to exceed to your request. Sometime official interest took the form of a patronizing pat on the head. I am sure your scheme for establishing peace will meet with response from our Prime Minister and another. He, the Minister of Education, is glad to see you are taking to root out communalism. He suggested that you get in touch with the local, a local official asked not to be seen. I thank you for all that you have written and the fine sentiments which you have expressed. It is no use arguing the matter as I do not think that I can serve any useful purpose by joining the organization which you wish to set up and therefore you need not take the trouble of seeing me. I wish you, however, all the success. In October after the Calcutta riots in, of 1947, Abe wrote to the chairman of the Rehabilitation Committee who replied regarding 
Hari Kirtan and Prashadam, you may make any program of your own, but I am afraid I am not interested in the same, nor my committee, and therefore there is no necessity of your meeting with me. Abe was fulfilling the, his role as a Vaishnava preacher, and the secretaries of the various government officers were recognizing and addressing him as such, but they could not appreciate his application of the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita and his suggestions for Hari Kirtan. Occasionally, however, someone seemed interested. Mr. N. P. Asthana High Court Advocate replied, I am very much obliged to you for your letter. Your broad scheme about spiritual improvement, I thoroughly appreciate the fine feeling which have prompted you to write this letter and the kindness with which you have considered my query. I have been a student of Bhagavad Gita and have also imbibed some of his teaching, but I still lack a good deal and will be glad to be guided by a person of your accomplishment. You may kindly therefore send your scheme to me on receipt of which I will be able to express my views. It was inevitable that Abe would think of engaging Mahatma Gandhi in devotional service because of his lifetime of courageous, aesthetic and moral activities on behalf of his countrymen. Mahatma Gandhi had great power to influence the Indian masses. As with Mahendra Pratap of the World Federation, Mahatma Gandhi's idea of serving God was to try to bring happiness to man through politics and through his own invented method. As one Englishman had said of Mahatma Gandhi, he is either a saint amongst politicians or a politician amongst the saints. But be that as it may, he was not as yet fully engaged in pure devotional service and his activities were not those of a Mahatma as described in Bhagavad Gita. The Gita defines the Mahatma as one who fully engages in worshipping Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, always chanting his glories, the Mahatma encourages others to surrender to Krishna. But because as a young man, Abhe had been a follower of Gandhi, Abhe had a special feeling for him. Of course, Srila Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati had later convinced him to engage exclusively in devotional service. But now Abhe felt his old friendship for Gandhi, even though Gandhi was a towering figure of worldwide fame and Abhe unknown both to Gandhi and to the world. On December 7, 1947, Abhe wrote to Gandhi from Kanpur. Gandhi was living at the Birla mansion in Gandhi, Delhi, where large military forces throughout the city discouraged Hindu-Muslim rioting. Gandhi's secretary, Pyare Lal Nair, described Gandhi at this time as the saddest man one could picture. The men he had led in the struggle for Indian independence, Jawala, Nehru, Vallabhbhai Patel and others had taken the leadership of the nation and Gandhi with his doctrines of non-violence, unity and agrarianism was now at odds with him in many ways. He feared he was becoming an anchorianism. His former colleagues admired him but rejected his leadership. All his program, Hindu-Muslim unity, non-violence, upliftment of the poor, although praised throughout the world, were failures in the India of 1947. On a recent visit to a Muslim refugee camp, a crowd of Muslims who surrounded his car had cursed him, and a public prayer meeting, a Hindu crowd had shouted him down and ended his meeting when he had attempted to read from the Quran. At 78 years, Gandhi was physically weak and melancholy. In all likelihood, Abe's letter would never reach him. Abe knew it. Sending a letter to Gandhi would be like putting a note in a bottle and sending it to sea. It would arrive in the flood of mails and Gandhi would be too busy to see it. But Abe sent it nonetheless. Dear friend Mahatma Ji, please accept my respectful namaskar. I am your unknown friend, but I had to write to you at times and again, although you never care to reply them. I sent you my papers back to Godhead, but your secretaries told me 
that you what you had very little time to read letters and much less for reading the magazine i asked for an interview with you but your busy secretaries never care to reply this anyway as i am your very old friend although unknown to you i am writing to you in order to bring you to the rightful position deserved by you as a sincere friend i must not deviate from my duty towards the friend like your good self i tell you as a sincere friend that you must immediately retire from active politics if you do not desire to die an inglorious death you have 125 years to live as you have desire to live but if you die an inglorious death it is no worth the honor and prestige that you have obtained during the course of your present lifetime were not possible to be obtained by anyone else within the living memory but you must know that all these honors and prestige were false in as much as they were created by the illusory energy of godhead called the maya by this falsity i do not mean to say that you are so many friends were false to you nor you were false to them by this falsity i mean illusion or in other words the false friendship and honors obtained thereby were but creation of maya and therefore they were are always temporary or false as you may call it but none of you neither your friends nor yourself know this truth a sadhu is not supposed to flatter but to cut this is the basis of his friendship that he cuts away the illusion of the materialistic person mahatma gandhi forsaken by his friends bitterly disappointed at the outcome of the long hard struggle for indian independence had an apprehensive about the future had been reduced to a position in which he might be able to realize that his friends and work were ultimately temporary thus it was the perfect time for him to comprehend abhay's message now by the grace of god that illusion is going to be cleared and thus your faithful friend like acharya kriplani and others are accusing you for your inability at the present moment to give them any practical program of work as you happen to give them during your glorious days of non cooperation movement so you are also in a plight to find out a proper solution for the present political tangle created by your opponent you should therefore take a note of warning from your insignificant friend like me that unless you retire timely from politics and engage yourself 100% in the preaching work of bhagavad gita which is the real function of the mahatma you shall have to meet with such inglorious death as mussolin hitler or lloyd george met with for years abe had wanted to approach mahatma gandhi with this message in fact he had written before although it had been of no avail but now he was convinced that unless gandhi got out of politics he would soon die an inglorious death that gandhi was remaining active in politics rather than preaching devotional service put him in need of a warning abe was writing to save a friend you can easily understand as to how some of your political enemies in the garb of friends both indian and english have deliberately cheated you and have broken your heart by doing the same mischief for which you have struggled so hard for so many years you wanted chiefly hindu muslim unity in india and they have tactfully managed to undo your work by creation of pakistan and india separately you wanted freedom for india but they have given permanent dependence of india you wanted to do something for the upliftment of the position of the bangis but they are still rotting as bangis even though you are living in the bangi colony they are all there for illusion and when these things will be presented to you as they are you must consider them as god sent god has favored you by dissipating 
the illusion you were hovering uh, in and by the same il illusion you were nursing those ideas as truth. Abe dutifully attempted to inform Gandhi that there was nothing absolute within this relative world. Ahimsa or non-violence must always be followed by violence. Just as light is followed by darkness, nothing is absolute truth in the dual world. You did not know this, wrote Abey, neither you ever cared to know this from the right source. And therefore, all your attempts to create unity were followed by disunity. And Ahimsa was followed by Himsa. Abey pointed out that Gandhi had never undergone a standard practice for spiritual advancement, namely accepting a bona fide spiritual master. Although Bhagavad Gita declares the necessity of accepting a guru in disciple succession, Gandhi was well known for listening to his inner voice and for extracting ideas for various writers like Ruskin and Thoria and mixing them with teachings from the New Testament and the Gita. Had Gandhi approached a guru and said away, he would not have become bewildered within the sphere of relative truth. In the Katha Upanishad, it is ordered that one must approach the bona fide guru, who is not only well versed in all the scriptures of the world, but is also realized soul in Brahmana, the Absolute. In order to learn the science of Absolute Truth, so also it is instructed in the Bhagavad Gita as follows. But I know that you never underwent such transcendental teaching except some severe penance which you invented for your purpose as you have invented so many things in the course of experimenting with the relative truth. You might have easily avoided them if you had approached the Guru as mentioned above. Recognizing Mahatma Gandhi's godly qualities and austerities, Abe requested him to employ his moral elevation for surrendering to the absolute truth. Abe urged him to get out of politics immediately. But your sincere efforts to attain some godly qualities by austerities, etc., surely have raised you to some higher platform which you can better utilize for the purpose of the absolute truth. If you, however, remain satisfied with such temporary position only and do not try to know the absolute truth, then surely you are to fall down from the artificially exalted position under the law of nature. But if you want really to approach the absolute truth and want to do some real good to the people in general all over the world, which shall include your ideas of unity, peace, and non-violence, then you must give up the rotten politics immediately and rise up for the preaching work of the philosophy and religion of Bhagavad Gita without offering unnecessary and dogmatic interpretation on them. I had occasionally discussed this subject in my paper, Back to Godhead, and a leaf from the same is enclosed herewith for your reference. I would only request you to retire from politics at least for a month only and let us have discussion on the Bhagavad Gita. I am sure thereby that you shall get a new light from the result of such discussion, not only for your benefit, but for the benefit of the world at large, as I know that you are sincere, honest, and a moralist, awaiting your early reply with interest, you are sincerely away Charan Day. There was no reply. A month later, Gandhi announced that he would fast until death unless India made a payment of 550 million rupees to Pakistan, a previous condition of the partition agreement. At first, Hindu refugees from Pakistan demonstrated outside Gandhi's darkened room chanting, let Gandhi die. But as he fasted each day closer to death, he aroused the heartfelt concern of the nation and the government leaders repaid the money to Pakistan. Then great crowds approached him, chanting, let Gandhi live. Meanwhile, Hindu-Muslim violence continued. 
on January 30, the day after he had drafted a new constitution for the Congress party, Gandhi took his evening meal, worked at his spinning wheel, then walked towards his evening pair meeting and was shot three times in the chest. He died crying out the name of God, Hey Ram. Away's letter of the previous month suddenly read like a prophecy, but it had not been read by the person for whom it had been intended. When the directors of the Mahatma Gandhi Memorial National Fund invited suggestion on how to commemorate Gandhi's life and work, Abe wrote to them and simultaneously to Vallabhai Patel, India's Deputy Prime Minister, proposing the Gandhian way to use the funds. Gandhi's whole life was dedicated to the service of humanity at large. His special interest for raising the moral standards. His later activities show that he was equal to everyone and all the people of the world knew him more as a spiritual leader than a merry politician. Devotion to Godhead was his ultimate aim and when I say that his sacred memory should be perpetrated not in the ordinary way but in the Gandhian way, I mean that fitting respects to his memory will be done in the following manner. Abe wrote of a Mahatma Gandhi really described. Gandhi as a Vaishnava, despite his pressing political activities, Gandhi had never missed his daily prayer meeting in the evening. Even at the time of his assassination, he had been on his way to attend his daily Kirtan. Abe stressed that it was because of Gandhi's regular participation in congregational prayer that he had been strong in his work to raise the moral standards of humanity. Gandhiji, minus his spiritual activities, Abe wrote, is an ordinary politician, but actually he was a saint amongst the statesmen. Abe wrote that it had been Lord Chaitanya who had originated the congregational chanting of the names of Krishna and Rama, and his followers, the six Goswamis, had left a wealth of literature for discussion and understanding. The Memorial Fund Board should take this lesson from Mahatmaji, practical life, and develop it on a large scale. Therefore, one fitting memorial to Mahatma Gandhi would be to institute daily congregational reading from the Bhagavad Gita, when people's spiritual instincts were kindled by daily prayer meeting. Then, they would develop the highest qualities in their character. Abe had a second suggestion. Gandhi was known for his attempts to enable the lower classes to enter the temple and in Nokahali, he had installed the deity of Radha and Krishna for the ordinary man to worship. Although this was generally taken as a side issue of Gandhi's work, Abe took it as the essence that Gandhi was a thesis movement. Abe explained that although there were hundreds and thousands of temples in, in India, they were not being properly managed and therefore educated citizens were neglecting them. In the original Vedic culture, the purpose of the temples had been to nurture spiritual culture. If the temples of India could be recognized as vital spiritual centers, then the disturbed minds of the day could be trained for life's higher duties. Such education and practices, Abe wrote, can help man in realizing the existence of God, without whose sanction awarded to Mahatma Gandhi, not a blade of grass moves. He also referred to Gandhi's Harijan movement, which most people saw as Gandhi's humanitarian effort to grant equal rights to untouchable whom Gandhi had recognized as Harijan, people of God. Abe stressed that this was also an essentially spiritual aspect of Gandhi's life, but rather than simply rubber stamping and untouchable as Harijan, Abe argued that there must be a systematic program for elevating people of the lower classes. This program was taught in the Bhagavad Gita and could best be applied under the guidance of a bona fide devotee of the Lord. Abe volunteered 
to take up the work on behalf of the memorial board if the board in attempting to commemorate gandhi's effort and accomplishment neglected the essential spiritual aspect of gandhi's life abe won his memory will soon be dead as has been a lot of other politicians perhaps they saw abe as another opportunistic seeking money or as a sectarian religious but abe saw himself as a lowly servant of shrila bhakti siddhant saraswati seeing certain vaishnavas qualities in the character of mahatma gandhi abe took the opportunity to introduce his spiritual masters message to the world and by so doing he paid tribute to mahatma gandhi praising him as a great devotee interested in kirtan temple worship and elevating unfortunates to become people of god while on a business in madurai in south india abe showed some of his writings to muttu swami chetty another medical salesman mr chetty was impressed and felt he could persuade his wealthy friend dr alagappa the famous birla of the south to finance the printing in april of 1948 mr chetty wrote to abe saying that he had been prompted to help abe for something god has meant he asked abe charan to send him the complete gita upanishad manuscript so that he could present it to <coughs> dr alagappa in madras mr chetty had already written dr alagappa about the first class work gita upanishad to cover 1200 pages of royal size and had urged him to publish it for the benefit of religious minded people he had also mentioned that abe had been trying to publish the book since 1946 Dr. Alagappa soon replied to uh, Mr. Chetty that he was interested, and Mr. Chetty wrote to Abe, "So I am on my way to help you, and only God must help me." As for talking business with Dr. Alagappa, there would be no need, since once he does it, it is for the sake of benevolence, anticipating success. Mr. Chetty invited Abe to come to Madras to meet Dr. Alagappa. There he will arrange for what God has meant for you to do in your religious duty. In Madras, Abe would be able to check and correct the proofs of the manuscript and see the book through the various stages of printing. It was a big opportunity, and Abe was not one to miss an opportunity. If the book could be published. it would be a great victory in his mission to fulfill the request of shrila bhakti siddhant saraswati but then the worst thing happened the manuscript was stolen it was the only copy the only one abe was keeping safely at home he questioned his family and servants no one knew what had happened abe was baffled so much work had been undone he felt he had worked so many months for nothing although he couldn't prove anything he suspected that his servants or even his son might have done it with a motive for raising money but it remained a mystery during 1949 abe wrote articles in bengali and submitted them to his god brother bp keshav maharaj who published them in his godia patrika abe's format for addressing world problem was the same as a spiritual master even at their first meeting in 1922 shri lakshmi siddhant saraswati had countered abe's nationalistic argument by stressing that the real crisis in the world was neither social nor political nor anything material but was simply the dearth of transcendental knowledge abe simply elaborated on this theme he never advocated that the ordinary concern of the world be disregarded but he stressed that crises can be solved only when the leadership is god conscious if krishna conscious were put first other concerns would be brought into line but with without krishna consciousness so called solution were only folly abe began his first bengali article by quoting an editorial
from the Allahabad edition of the Calcutta newspaper Amrit Bazar. The editor had sorely lamented that India's worst troubles had not yet ended despite the national independence. The National Week has begun. The memories of Jallian Bala Bagh and political serfdom no longer trouble us, but our trouble is far from being at an end. In the dispensation of providence, mankind cannot have any rest. If one kind of trouble goes, another quickly follows India. Politically free is faced with difficulties no less serious than those that troubled us under a foreign rule. Abe seized on this editorial reflection as proof of the basic defect of all worldly plans for amelioration. He pointed out that although India had been subjugated by foreign rulers since the time of Mohammed Ghori, 1050 AD, India prior to that had never been subjugated. In those days, India had been a God-conscious nation. It was when India's leader had abandoned their spiritual heritage that India had fallen. Thus, Indians should see that they were now being punished by the stringent laws of material nature. The honorable editor of Amrit Bazar Patrika, Abe noted, has written so sadly, if one trouble goes, another quickly follows. But that was stated in the Bhagavad Gita a long time previously. It was the same theme he has stated in his 1944 Back to Godhead article and the theme of so many of his letters also. Man, due to his neglect of the Supreme Lord, is being punished by material nature, which is directly controlled by the Supreme Lord. Men may write newspaper articles, pass measures at meetings and conferences and attempt to overcome nature by scientific research, yet they will remain unable to surmount nature's law. As they try to escape their punishment, the Supreme Lord will cast them deeper into illusion and they will fail miserably. Abhay quoted an appropriate Bengali saying, I was trying to make a statue of Shiva, but I ended up making a monkey. In order to rid the world of misery and bring about happiness, we have now created the atomic bomb, seeing the all-pervading destruction which could take place in the near future by atomic reaction. Western thinkers have become greatly disturbed. Some people try to give consolation, say things that we will only use this atomic bomb to bring about happiness in the world. This is also another enigma of the illusory potential. The problem Abhi explained was that the world was lacking Krishna conscious devotees. Leaders under the influence of material nature could never solve the problem of the world. Materialistic illusion was especially prevalent in the western countries, which Indians should not try to imitate. Abhi prophesies, however, that Krishna consciousness would one day reach the west. In the western countries, there has never been any discussion of the relation between, between atomic individual soul and the supreme complete conscious personality of Godhead. Neither their activities nor their state in ultimate perfection has been investigated. That is why even though they have made so much material advancement, they are skimmering in the burning poison of sensualism. We can be absolutely certain that India's real peace formula will one day reach their ears. Abhay's article began appearing regularly in the Gaudiya Patrika. His god brothers appreciated his writings. His denunciation of the materialistic mentality was reminiscent of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. In Abhay's hands, the Bhagavad Gita's concept of the Asuras, demon, was no longer merely a depiction of a mythological or a legendary enemy. The Asuras had come to life in the modern day, Hitler, Churchill, or even an Indian Prime Minister. But as Abe pointed out, his denunciation of the misleaders was not his own. 
he was only repeating the words of Krishna. During 1950-51, he continued his letter writing, attempting to gain a hearing with various organizational and leaders. He wrote the World Pacific Committee, the President of India and the Minister of Education. He wrote to the Indian Congress for Cultural Freedom, which wrote back suggesting that Abe had written them by mistake. He wrote to an official of the All Religious Conference in Bombay, advising that because of their approach, nothing practical could come out of their conference. The practical solution is lying in the transcendental message of Shri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, as given by him in the Bhagavad Gita. On September 14, 1951, he corresponded with Daniel Bailey of the American Reporter a magazine published by the American Embassy in New Delhi. Abe pointed out that the philosophy of understanding the absolute truth as realized by the sages of India was higher than attempts to combine East and West. Mr. Bailey replied that he was aware of Eastern philosophical and religious influence in the West and cited the progress of a yoga mission in New York City, which he said had some influence on the Protestants in America. But when Abe asked if one of his articles could appear in the American reporter, Mr. Bailey replied, if we were to give considerable space in the American reporter to say the Gita, we in all fairness would have to give equal space to other philosophies and our desire is not to endorse or condemn any one of them, but simply to assist in a better understanding. In a future reply, Abe deferred with Mr. Bailey's contention that people should be encouraged to make their own interpretation of religion. Less intelligent men are always guided by those who are superior in knowledge in all spheres of life. Abe even wrote the Ford Foundation in Detroit and a staff assistant wrote back. I regret to advise you that we are unable to pursue your suggestion concerning the establishment of an association of the intelligent class of men. The Ford Foundation has no program in which specific ideas such as you describe might be included. Although most of his suggestions were rejected, occasionally he received words of appreciation. A certain Dr. Muhammad Sayyid, PhD, a professor of the University of Allahabad, wrote, You seem to have assimilated the universal teachings of ancient India, which is really laudable. And the governor of Uttar Pradesh replied, You are doing noble work, for nothing is nobler than to be God-minded. Not only was Abe giving advice in his letters, but he was hinting that he could also give practical help. If he could obtain institutional backing, he was prepared to do many things. Teach classes, manage temples, teach temple worship, and initiate devotees, as well as organize various kinds of field work to propagate the principle of Bhagavad Gita. Usually, he did not spell out practically exactly how things should be done. But he pointed to the philosophical defects in the present method and the superiority of working in accordance with the Vedic literature. By the grace of his spiritual master, he knew the science of applying Bhagavad Gita to almost any situation. If someone would only show interest, he could teach that person the superiority of working according to the Bhagavad Gita. After attending a meeting in which a prominent industrialist had traced harmonious relation between labor and management in his factory, Abe wrote a long letter suggesting the man consider the good effects the congregational chanting of Hare Krishna could produce. Since the factory had a special employee club and a lounge, Abe suggested that the worker assemble there and chant. Hare Krishna. Abhay urged everyone to surrender to Krishna, but most people had their own philosophies 
and took his spirit to be secretarian or proselytizing. But Bhagavad Gita was universal. Abhi wrote and God could not be omitted from any program even in the name of a secular state. Krishna as the father of all living beings has judication over all programs, organizations and governments. Indians especially should appreciate the universal scope of the Bhagavad Gita. Although Abe always had a plan of action behind his suggestion, he first sought the interest of the correspondent. There wasn't much interest and he was repeatedly turned down, but he never felt discouraged. He always anticipated finding a sympathizer. He kept copies of all his letters and their replies and a word of appreciation or a slight show of interest from a correspondent being sufficient to elect from Abe another thoughtful reply. He had developed a keen sense of dedication to Lord Chaitanya's mission without expecting leadership from the Gaudiya Mad. He still cherished the idea that his god brothers would soon come together and preach, but he didn't put any energy in the Mad. Since to do so would mean to become involved in one of the faction. Staying clear of the Gaudiya Mas internal fray, Abe continued his letter writing campaign alone, introducing himself as a preacher of Bhagavad Gita and editor of Back to Godhead magazine. 1948, Abe closes Lucknow factory. He had fallen behind in employees salaries and since 1946 he had been paying past rent in installment. But when sales dropped off, continuing the factory became impossible. He lost everything. Shira Prabhupada said, I started a big laboratory in Lucknow. Those were golden days. My business flourished like anything. Everyone in the chemical business knew, but then gradually everything dwindled. With the help of some acquaintances in Allahabad, he opened a small factory there, in the same city where his Prayag pharmacy had failed 15 years before. He moved to Allahabad with his son, Vrindavan, and continued manufacturing medicine, while the rest of the family remained in Banerjee Lane in Calcutta. Abe continued his traveling, but now he was often away for months at a time. And then he had the dream a second time. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati appeared before him again. He was beckoning, indicating that Abhay should take sannyas. And again, Abhay had to put the dream aside. He was a householder with many responsibilities. To take sannyas would mean to give up everything. He had to earn money. He now had five children. Why is Guru Maharaj asking me to take sannyas? He thought it was not possible now. The Allahabad business was unsuccessful. At present, the condition of our business is not very good. He wrote his servant Goranga, who had asked to rejoin him. When the condition gets better and if you are free at that time, I will call you. He worked earnestly but results were meager. As with everything else, Abhay saw his present circumstances through the eyes of the scriptures, and he could not help think of the verse from Srimad Bhagavatam. Yashyashyama anugrani harishetad dhanam sanahi tato dhanam tyajantya asya Savajana dukha dukhaitam. When I feel especially merciful towards someone, I gradually take away all his material possession, his friends and his relatives, then reject this poverty-stricken and most wretched fellow. He had heard Srila Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati quote the words, and now he thought of it often. He took it that his present circumstances were controlled by Lord Krishna, who was forcing him into a helpless position, freeing him for preaching Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada said, 
somehow or the other my intentions for preaching the message of lord chaitanya mahaprabhu increased and the other side decreased i was not disinclined but krishna forced me you must give it up the history is known how it decreased 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 in shrimad bhagavatam queen kunti had also prayed my dear lord krishna your lordship can easily be approached but only by those who are materially exhausted only who is on the path of material progress trying to improve himself with respectable parentage great opulences high education and bodily beauty cannot approach you with sincere feeling shrila prabhupad said so in 1950 i retired practically not retired but a little in touch but business whatever is going on then almost it became nil whatever was there all right you do whatever you like abhis wife independently moved along with her sons back to her father's house at 72 mahatma gandhi road she had reason that her financial support was becoming precarious abhi was spending most of his time away from home he was gradually dissociating himself from the family then after several months he would meet his wife and children his father in law would criticize him you are always going outside you are always worshiping god you are not looking after my family whenever he could abhi would spend his money some money mr sudhir kumar dat abhi's nephew said i sometimes notice how he was thinking so many things about his family about his writing about making bigger and bigger in business what to do what to do he was thinking seriously to earn more money from his business but that means he has to give more time for this business and his writing he did never give up he was writing more and more and people sometimes abused him hey you are writing religious things you are only thinking of god then who will maintain your family what will you do for the family sometime he argued with them what has this family given me why should i forget about god this is the real thing what i am doing you cannot realize what i am doing on a visit to calcutta abhay stayed at the home of his father in law where he was given his own room when his wife served him dinner he noticed that everything had been purchased from the market how is this he asked the cook is sick today radha rani replied although abhay thought it is better that we not live here at the home of her father or else she will be spoiled even more so he moved his family to a new address on chetla street here he sometimes stayed with his family for a few months writing articles and doing a minimal amount of business but most of the time he stayed in alabad in alabad abhay now 54 dip like a vana prashta for one who was retired from family life he was indifferent to the activities of family and business activities a family man generally considers his prime objects of responsibility and happiness in his writing abey had several time discussed the four ashrams or spiritual divisions of the vedic society brahmacharya grastha vana prashta and sanyas in the first division the brahmacharya ashram a young boy's parents send him to the place of the guru or gurukula where he lives a simple life studying the vedic literature under the guidance of his guru thus in his childhood and youth he learns the principles of austerity and spiritual knowledge that form the basis for his entire life at the age of 21 the brahmacharya may make take a wife and thus enter the next ashram the grast ashram or like 
Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, he may choose to remain a lifelong brahmacharya in his boyhood. Abhi had remained a celibate and had imbibed the principles of devotion to Krishna from his father and mother. Although he had lived at home, his upbringing had been the equivalent of a brahmachari life. And by marriage at the age of 21, he had entered the Grast Ashram at the appropriate age. Gaur Mohan's example had shown Abhay how to remain a devotee of Krishna even in family life. And as Vaishnavas, Abhay and his wife had avoided the excess of materialistic household life. At 50, a man is supposed to retire from his family activities. And this stage is called Vanaprastha. In the Vanaprastha ashram, both man and wife agree to abstain from further sexual contact and they may continue living together, but the emphasis is on spiritual partnership. As Vanaprastha, they may travel together on pilgrim, the holy places in India, preparing for their inevitable departure from the material world. Thus, the Vedic ashram, after allowing one to fulfill material life, enable one to end the cycle of repeated birth and death and attain the eternal spiritual world. A man of 50 should be able to see by his aging body that inevitable death is approaching and he should have the good sense to prepare. In the final division of Sanyas Ashram, the man places his wife in the care of a grown son and fully dedicated himself to the serving the Supreme Lord. Formerly, the Sanyas Ashram meant a solitary life of penance in the Himalayas. But in the Gaudiya Vaishnav line, Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati had emphasized preaching. Although Abhay had not formally defined his status within the four ashram, he appeared to be living more as a Vanaprastha than a Grastha. He saw his business failures and his distasteful family situation as Krishna's blessings, freeing him from family responsibilities and turning him wholeheartedly towards executing Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's order to preach. In Allahabad, Abhi managed to save enough money to revive the printing of Back to Godhead. And in February 1952, from his editorial office and home at 57B Caning Road, the first issue of eight years appeared. As before, he did everything himself, all the writing, typing, editing, meeting with the printer and finally distributing the copies by hand as well as mailing them to respectable leaders throughout the India. This he left felt was the real purpose of living in Allahabad or anywhere this was the best use of money, the purpose of human life to engage fully in glorifying the Supreme Lord. Other things were temporary and would soon be lost. When he visited the family in Calcutta, old friends would gather in his room and he would preach and give classes on Bhagavad Gita. Abhi invited his wife and family to take part in this discussion, but they would resolutely sit in an upstairs room, often taking tea as if in defiance of his preaching. Abhi was supporting them, he was still associating with them, but he was bent on preaching and they were not making it attractive for him to do so within the family. If there were to be family life for Abhay, then his wife and son would have to recognize and rejoice in the fact that he was becoming a full-fledged preacher. They would have to understand that his life concern was to serve his spiritual master's mission. They could not simply ignore his transformation they could not insist that he was simply an ordinary man. Abe continued to try to draw his wife in hoping she would gradually follow him in the preacher's life, but she had not the slightest interest in her husband's preaching. And why should he spend his days worrying about family, chemical and money? Let his relatives criticize, but back to Godhead was a real service. He could offer to the whole family of mankind. Madhvendra Puri, a great spiritual receptor and 
and predecessor of Lord Chaitanya, had written about a devotee's indifference to worldly criticism. O oh, demigods and forefathers, please excuse me. I am unable to perform any more offerings for your pleasure. Now I have decided to free myself from all reactions to sins simply by remembering anywhere and everywhere the great descendants of Yadu and the great enemy of Kamsa, Lord Krishna. I think that this is sufficient for me. So what is the use of further endeavors? Let the sharp moralist accuse me of being illusion. I do not mind. Experts in Vedic activities may slander me as being misled. Friends and relatives may call me frustrated. My brothers may call me a fool. The wealthy Mammonites may point me out as mad and the learned philosophers may assert that I am much too proud. Still my mind does not budge an inch from the determination to serve the lotus feet of Govinda, though I am unable to do it. Such were the words of Madhvendra Puri. Why should he waste time with petty family problems when he held answers to the problems of India and the world? As a knower of Bhagavad Gita, he felt that his first obligation was to offer solution to the complex crisis of war, hunger and immortality, crime, all symptoms of godlessness and if dedicating himself to such work meant that other lesser responsibilities suffered, then there was no loss. In March 1952, Abe published another issue of Back to Godhead. It was dedicated mostly to a biographical article Abe had written about Srila Bhakti Siddhan Saraswati and his father Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur. He wrote, he Bhakti Vinod Thakur vehemently protested against the principles of those pseudo transcendentalists now passed in the name of Lord Chaitanya. He initiated the reformatory movement by literary contribution while he still engaged as a high government official. During his householder life, and serving as a magistrate, he wrote books of various descriptions in Bengali, English, Sanskrit, etc. to present an actual picture of pure devotional activities to Lord Chaitanya. Shrila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati of Goswami Maharaj got inspiration from his very childhood all about Shrila Thakur Bhakti Vinod movement. He worked as the private secretary of Shrila Bhakti Vinod Thakur and as such Bhakti Vinod Thakur gave him Srila Saraswati Thakur the transcendental power of attorney to espouse the cause of Lord Chaitanya and so after Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur's departure Srila Saraswati Thakur took up the reign of that reformatory movement. Absorbed in producing his monthly journal Abhay went about his other activities only superficially. Sometime he travelled on business or taking the night train from Allahabad to Calcutta, visited his family. When his compartment was not crowded, he would turn on a light while others slept. Riding a night train provided a good opportunity to think or even write. Sometime he would sleep for a few hours and then sit up again and look up the window to see only night and the reflected lights of the train compartment shining back to him, the windows reflecting his face. Halfway through the 12-hour journey, the sky would lighten, turning from gray to light blue, and the first white clouds would appear in the sky. He would see lights in the towns and hear the train on warning when the train showed and stopped at a station, tea vendors would walk alongside and a train windows yelling, Chai, Chai, Chai. Their loud sing song din filling the ears with Chai and Chai filling the air with its aroma as hundreds of passengers sip their morning tea. During his more 
in 20 years of extensive train travel abhi had noticed more and more people smoking cigarettes and more and more women traveling alone india was becoming westernized and the national leaders were paving the way the blind leading the blind they wanted the kingdom of god without god they wanted a progressive industrialized india without krishna from the windows he could see large fields being left uncultivated and yet people were hungry abey would sometime read a newspaper and cut out an article that seemed to warrant a reply in back to god or that sparked an idea for an essay he would deliberate over how to approach people for assistance whom to approach and how to start a society of krishna conscious devotees people not only in india but all over the world could take to krishna consciousness the chaitanya bhagavatam had predicted that the name of the lord chaitanya would one day be known in every town and village shrila bhakti siddhant saraswati had wanted that he had sent preachers to england but that had only gained a protocol visit with the royalty student line board before the crown and then come back to india without affecting any change in the western people abey thought about sending back to god at abroad his agent hacker spring and company had contacts in america and europe people read english all over the world and some of them would surely appreciate the ideas from bhagavad gita and shrimad bhagavatam this was what shrila bhakti siddhant saraswati had wanted krishna consciousness was not for india alone it was india's greatest gift and it was for everyone thus we come to the end of uh, chapter 6 or episode 7 of uh, the audio visual of uh, lila mrit here we had the blessings of uh, his divine grace lokna swami maharaj and please wait for episode 8 uh, which is chapter 7 of lila mrit jhansi the league of devotees hari krishna